Thank you, Sheikh Hisham. I, I, I was trying to estimate that how, how long would I have to practice to be able to recite the Quran like Sheikh Hisham, and I realized probably if I tried for 100 years, I won't be able to do it that well. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this panel on faith and duty to social justice. Uh, I'm sure you, you must have often uh, heard the media referred to as the fourth estate. Uh, people talk about the media as the fourth estate of the republic. Uh, what perhaps is rarely mentioned is that religion is the first estate uh, of a republic. And uh, uh, religion remains important to most societies. I understand and recognize that today, particularly in the West and in the United States, uh, more and more people are moving away from organized religion. Uh, nevertheless, religion and religious lives and religious values remain a fundamental constitutive element of American politics and American society. So any discussion of social justice cannot ignore the religious duty to combat and fight for social justice. So in this panel, uh, we have uh, uh, literally a buffet of religious perspectives on social justice. We have speakers from who will be speaking from an Islamic perspective, Christian perspective, Jewish, Hindu, and Sikh perspective. Uh, if you remember in the morning I was talking about uh, the, the idea of the Abrahamic tradition and uh, when, when we advocate the concept of Abrahamic tradition, we're, we fail to recognize that there are other religions in the United States who may not fall under the umbrella of the Abrahamic tradition, such as uh, the Sikh faith and Hindu religion. And given the significance and importance of both these communities to the United States, I think we are still searching for a new interfaith paradigm, which will include Hinduism and Sikhism and others also into uh, a mosaic of American religious foundation. Uh, so we will start with all of these speakers. Uh, I will make a few opening remarks, and, and we will end with the keynote address from Sheikh Yusuf Yestis. Uh, I have some housekeeping comments to make. We have the TEDx banner here, but this is not a TEDx event. Only the breakaway sessions, the panels three, four, and five, which is between 12.15 and 1.30, those are the TEDx panels. Uh, and so, but we need, we, we have a TEDx session here in 12.15, that's why the banner is there. So I just want to make it clear that this is not a TEDx session. Uh, all the plenary sessions are not TEDx sessions, only the breakaway sessions are TEDx sessions. Uh, TEDx is very particular about the, spe the speculations uh, about what constitutes a TEDx session. Uh, after this panel, we will break for lunch and for prayer. And if you look at the maps on this, you can see that the prayer area and the lunch area are clearly marked. Uh, I want to begin by sharing with you a verse from the Quran. Uh, in this verse, God says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَقْفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ أَلَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرِيَةِ لِلْظَّالِمِ أَهْلُهَا وَاجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا وَاجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ نَصِيرًا What this verse says is so powerful and it addresses Muslims today and everybody else clearly it says, I mean, in a colloquial sense, Bama, like, what's up with you? God is saying, what's up with you all? What's up with you all that you will not struggle in the path of God for the oppressed? God is saying, what's wrong with you people that you will not struggle in the path of God for the oppressed? For those men and women and children, those men, those women and children who are saying to me, to God, saying to me, oh God, please rescue us. Please rescue us from this oppressive city, from this oppressive city. So people are pleading to God and saying, oh God, rescue us. These men, women, and children who are pleading to God, oh God, rescue us from these oppressive cities and find for us a leader and find for us a helper. So God is addressing and saying, there are people out there who are begging me to help them escape their oppressive societies. When I was reading this, all I could think of were the Syrian refugees. 
they are praying every day to God and asking him to rescue them from the oppressive conditions that they are living in. And God is asking us, what is wrong with you that you do nothing? They need leaders. We are not providing them leadership. They need help. We are not providing them with help. They need wali. They need nasir. They need helpers. When I read verses in the Quran, I feel so profoundly guilty that we are not doing enough for those who are living in oppressive societies. We are so proud of the fact that we live in societies that are free, that we forget to be grateful to that. And the only way in which we can be grateful to the fact that we live in free societies is by struggling for the freedom of those who live in oppressive societies. There is much, much more in, in, in the Islamic tradition, in the Quran, that, that compel Muslims and advocate uh, Muslims and people of other community to stand up for justice and for social justice. And I'm, I'm not going to speak to that directly because there are other uh, more eloquent and more knowledgeable uh, imams on this panel who will address to that issue. But I do want to say this much, that a religion that does not unite humanity, a religion that not does not make the life of the people who practice that faith better. A religion that does not make the community in which that religion is practiced more peaceful, less harmful, and more equal, that religion is not worth following. God sent this religion to liberate us from false gods. God sent religion to empower us so that we stand up for justice for each one of us. So, I believe very firmly that this battle against injustices, and in our country, it is such a tragedy that while we are one of the best places to live in the world, we have extremely horrible things going on in this country. Income inequalities in this country across races is horrendous. The per capita income of white communities is nearly 13 times that of black communities. White people take more drugs, black people go to jail more often than white people. I was jokingly going around last week asking my white colleagues, what is it about their skin which makes it bulletproof? That you could be in a gunfight for three hours and not get injured. While there are young black kids who are shot 15, 16 times and they are shot even after they are dead. So we can see oppression, social media, cameras, television, 24 hour television, uh, uh, people's phones which are themselves like broadcasting television stations today. You can think of your as a television from all religious communities and social justice. Before I end, I want to request everybody in this hall to, to maintain a minute of silence uh, for the victims of the shooting in California. Thank you very much. When we actually, it's the only time we recognize how long a minute is when we maintain a minute of silence, uh, if you notice that. Uh, I hope we realize this, 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 this event that took place in California two, two days ago, I think is going to have a, a, a tremendously negative impact on Muslims in the United States, on Muslim Western relations, and also on the, on the human rights and social justice environment in this country. 
I think that one that one has done more to propel this country towards being more towards Muslims and being more intolerant towards uh, the rest of the Muslim world than many other events that have happened in the past. So it is in this light uh, that I open the panel. Our first speaker will be. One second, I think I've lost our first speaker. So, okay, so our keynote speaker is here. Our keynote speaker is Sheikh Yusuf Yestis, and I concede the floor to him. Thank you very much. Okay.